Welcome to the NYU AD Art Center podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on this series, we are very lucky to have on Dana Gingra as part of our conversation about the new piece Frontera, or well, new to NYU Abu Dhabi. Dana is a choreographer, filmmaker, performer, and teacher with 25 years plus career using different mediums and artistic practices, which have established her as a game-changing, boundary-pushing artist. Um, it is really exciting to have Frontera coming to NYU Abu Dhabi and very exciting to have you on the podcast. Welcome, Dana. Oh, it's so, so great. We are thrilled to be going to Abu Dhabi very soon. Yeah, very soon. Um, so, you know, when people think about I think a lot of people, when they think about dance as a medium, um, I think a lot of people think of like fun and something cute and something <laughs> sweet, like having a good time. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> I know, right? And I was watching pieces of Frontera online um, and reading about it. And it is a deeply intense piece. Um, mm. And it's not, it's not like <laughs> people just having fun on this, on the stage. Um, and so I wanted to ask you as somebody who does this for a living has built a career and, and a really, um, uh, a really impressive career doing that. How does it feel when I say that out loud? Are you like, God damn it, this is so annoying or what is your initial reaction to that type of um, presumption or expectation? Uh, well, I think it kind of, uh, well, it, it makes me um, smile inside uh, because I, I, I'm really interested in making work that is uh, visceral and viscerally affecting so that uh, viewers can, you know, not attend uh, performance in a passive way, but there's really um, this sense that they feel it in their own bodies. And so the work that I've, uh, you know, always been drawn to making is incredibly uh, physical, you know, physically demanding for the performers. It's trying to push the body. It's asking uh, for a kind of commitment uh, from the dancers uh, uh, that is not sort of, it, it's not normal. It's, it's pushing, they're always pushing themselves in a way that, uh, you know, it takes a great deal of courage to do this work. And yeah, it's a very kinetic experience. Yeah. So I want to set the scene um, uh, for Frontera. Well, actually, before that, how about we just talk about where you are coming from? So right now, I believe you're in Canada. Yeah, I'm just back in Montreal, which is home uh, for me. Um, yeah, I just I flew in late last night. I was in uh, Taiwan for the last month uh, teaching, so I'm a little like... Right now, it's the middle of the night yeah. in uh, <laughs> Southeast Asia, and it's afternoon here in Montreal, so I'm kind of displaced. But yes, uh, Montreal, Canada is uh, Quebec is uh, my home, and the the company Animals of Distinction it's our home, and uh, that's where we'll be coming from when we come to Abu Dhabi. Can I talk about the nouns that I I read in your bio? and the order in which they started becoming added to your professional identity. So choreographer, teacher, performer, filmmaker, and, and presumably a dancer, which is uh, implied. In what order did you become each of those things? Uh, I started as a performer dancer. Uh, that was sort of, uh, you know, I, I started a trajectory as a professional uh, dancer in uh, my early 20s and very soon I think I was 28 29 um, when I really started uh, choreographing uh, I would say my first company Holy Body Tattoo uh, 
maybe I was 25 actually when I started that. So I started choreographing quite early on. And then um, with that uh, first company, which was also, we were making very uh, intense, work. I was performing in the work. Uh, and then I slowly kind of made uh, my way into uh, also creating films. Uh, after I attended, uh, I did some film studies uh, it, when I was living in Los Angeles. And then I kind of split my time between making uh, large scale pieces and then making short dance films. Uh, in between. So uh, a teacher kind of came along. Uh, it was a very organic thing because usually you get asked to teach when we're on tour. But then uh, after having a really uh, kind of intense uh, knee injury performing and I had to have surgery, uh, uh, I uh, rehabilitated using the system called jar tonic and from that point on i became very passionate about teaching that system so uh mm -hmm. that sort of um i would say 20 years now i've been uh teaching that system as well has your approach to choreography and filmmaking changed in um in significant ways over the course of your career uh um, I've been interested. Filmmaking is is different. I think I've moved more and more into uh, like three D uh, animation, uh, you know, scanning. So working more in a really digital uh, realm. Uh, when we first started out, and there was film in pieces. Uh, often the film was like you know using uh, sixteen millimeter. Uh, film, 35 millimeter actual film, and over time is becoming more and more kind of fluent in this digital language. Actually, the image you have up on the screen right now is, is it's all like pixels of light that UVA sort of uh, choreographed in uh, a piece called Creation Destruction, where we're using really low-fi uh, uh, screens uh, and just using black and white pixels. So that's kind of using, um, you know, very up-to-date technology. But again, in a, I like this lo-fi kind of way yeah. or other ways of using things. Yeah. And talk to me about the, the sort of choreography process, how those things sort of work together. Uh how they work together, I, I guess it's always uh, in conversation. It's a dialogue between starting from imagining uh, uh, potentiality of uh, how the mediums could meet, uh, exploring with dancers, uh, uh, you know, working with their bodies, then seeing uh, how that translates into, you know, the different mediums I'm working with. So it, it's, I feel often uh, like a conversation. I don't start with this fixed idea and then see that idea through. I start with maybe a theme I'm interested in exploring. Uh, like right now we're looking at uh, free fall. And so it was this idea of uh, continuous falling. Uh, so what would happen if a body is just falling and falling and falling forever? And this piece was made for like a, a full dome experience. So the audience was lying on the ground, looking up at these bodies falling. And so here we have a scene that's kind of like, uh, you know, a little bit like Dante's Inferno, um, bodies falling, falling in this kind of uh, endless uh, spiral. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's always, yeah, just, uh, you know, it's, it's in, it's in the actual doing of it that things come together. But usually I propose a theme and then we start kind of exploring and that theme sometimes opens up and leads to other, you know, aspects that I didn't uh, foresee before. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And I work with really amazing, amazing artists. Uh, so, you know, I feel very privileged in my collaborations and that exchange is so rich. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I was talking, um, I was thinking about this, the Frontera piece, um, and 
originally I was like, okay, Nine Dancers, really cool. That That's the company, right? That's what I originally thought. Mm. Okay, the company is nine people. And then <laughs> upon looking at it, I was like, oh my God, th this is an insane production. Um, <laughs> so when you think about Animals of Distinction and the team that you just said, this team of collaborators, who is on this team? I mean, there's the music, there's lights, there's tech, there's a million things. Who Who's on the team for mm -hmm. somebody who's listening to this? So actually there's 10 dancers. I think originally we started out with nine and then uh, it grew to 10. Uh, and it's really, a, it's a collaboration with uh, Montreal-based musicians, Fly Pan Am, uh, who uh, were, they're kind of part of the constellation artists uh, like Godspeed You Black Emperor, um, mm -hmm. you know, so very Montreal scene. Uh, and they uh, just, they reformed uh, in, I think, 2017, 18. And so when I knew that they were reforming, I was like, oh, you know, are you interested in doing this collaboration, Frontera? And so they are a big part of the, the team. And then United Visual Artists, uh, that was my first collaboration with them. They came on board uh, to do the sonography and it's all, the sonography is all light because I didn't want any um, like objects on stage. I wanted the borders to be very liminal and what we call kind of uh, ghost borders. So they sort of are able to appear and disappear and reform and, uh, you know, they're constantly moving and uh you know, give us different kinds of images of what borders can be or what boundaries can be. Uh, so that's kind of the main main team. And then, of course, there's like, you know, a rehearsal director, uh, uh, there's a dramaturg, uh, uh, there's, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, technical team, there's the production team. Yeah. So I think there's about, um, I think about 20 of us on the road with this show, you know, sound men. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a big, it's a big family, a big group. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, not a lightweight production. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, okay. For the uninitiated, um, what is Frontera about? Or let me ask that question differently, actually. Hold on. Let me ask that question differently. What was it about when you first started working on it? And what is it about now? Mm. Uh, it was when I first started, uh, it really sort of got triggered around uh, like all of this uh, discussion in 2016 of First of all, the border wall between uh, the U.S. and Mexico, um, which seemed very much a kind of like, uh, it was like the theater of politics and uh, this idea that, you know, we're going to like create this wall and, you know, we're going to like just wall ourselves off, basically. And so I started kind of, uh, you know, thinking a lot about uh so borders, you know, you know how borders for some people, they're accessible. For other people, they're not accessible. Who decides? Uh, and then it led me to the idea of surveillance, kind of the idea of surveillance being so invisible and how there's this kind of oversight governing, uh, again, this, this movement. And then looking into this, this movement through borders, of course, uh, migration and looking at climate change, because uh, we're living in a time that not since World War II do we have uh, this many displaced people that are uh, having to leave their country because of famine, because of climate change. And so there's this huge uh, kind of uprooting and displacement that is uh, currently going on and uh, I think it's going to continue escalating. So the kind of the, you know, the subject just kept unfolding. Yeah. And so then within that, I, you know, started to think, well, you know, where is agency? Where does freedom lie? 
Uh, so physically, I, I became very interested in, uh, in France, they're called personnes. We also know them as uh, parkour artists. Parkour is the art of displacement. And I thought, oh, this is really interesting because it's they've made this art form, this physical art form out of uh, basically being able to pass and traverse through liminal space. Yeah, exactly. Space that is, you know, generally shut off to the public or inaccessible. And uh, so I started to work on on movement based on parkour. Uh, our version of parkour. So it's like, okay, these are the the, the lines of desire where we can cut through uh, the the urban landscape uh, in in a way that is not um, specified. Because there's a whole urban choreography there. We go, we walk down streets. We use our usual routes to go where we go. Everything is kind of like we just we follow these pathways and so we worked a lot with kind of the psychogeography uh Guy Debord uh psychogeography as a way of uh loosening up our our perception of how we move through organized space as so yeah so these things exist in contrast yeah so I remember I heard you talk about how sort of during COVID even they added an extra layer of this uh, these new borders that emerged. Um, mm-hmm. I want to talk a little bit about what that sort of looks like when you take it on the road. So there's a North American context that you're just you're describing now. Um, but yeah, you, you travel all over the place. You take the show everywhere. You're about to take it to Abu Dhabi. And when you re, you know, when you move a show like this that is so rooted in a universal idea but is like generated locally in a specific region Mm -hmm. what what new things do you sort of discover what new things do you expect to discover when you're like okay all of a sudden borders mean different things here and there are different frontiers to traverse uh and and freedom is you know a different concept in different places i you know i think that it it's only in sitting in the audience and feeling the audience's gaze on the work, because you know, you create ideally, you know, create a piece where people project their own experiences onto. So it changes the reading depending where we are, as you say. But it's really uh, in the moment of the performance or after the fact that I realized, okay, this is how it was read. This is how it was experienced. And there's a kind of understanding about the culture we're in from the audience's response. So, you know, it's always surprising. It's always like, okay, you don't know exactly because I can read about the context we're going in, but I can't tell what a, an assembly of people together is going to create, in a sense, when they project their experiences onto the work. Yeah. When, when, when you have this type of piece produced, what is your emotional reaction to it? I mean, are you... How do you feel about it when you're seeing it being uh, performed, what sort of effect does it have on you? Uh, it varies. You know, some some days it's really about the details and trying to, you know, just kind of, because I'm always tweaking the work sure. and it doesn't stay static. It's a work that premiered in 2019 and, you know, we had a nice uh, touring life after it was premiered in Australia, Berlin, uh, Canada, and then, of course, the pandemic happened and everything stopped. Uh, so I'm always like working on it, but then sometimes I try and just sit back. And I mean, obviously I, I can't just be like a regular audience member because I know what comes next, but I try <laughs> yeah. and sit back and feel the audience and get out of my head and just try and, you know, pick up on the bodies in the room. What, what's the, 
Are they leaning forward? Are they sitting back? Are they getting restless? Are they, uh, how are they responding? And just to try and feel it on that very uh, visceral level with the audience. Yeah. Let's talk about some of your other pieces. Um, and maybe let's talk about how you actually develop a piece over time. So is there, are there ideas cooking right now for, for your next production or do you kind of have to fully stop working on something and then you go into a residency and you develop something new? I mean, how does it really work for you? Uh, I think often, you know, pieces have, uh, you know, it's like editing film. You, you know, I, I make a large scale piece probably over three or four years and so much uh, material gets produced because a lot of the work I do is uh, task based improvisation where I am constantly uh, creating uh, structures that the dancers are improvising and I video lots and it's like we generate so much material. But then when it comes time to actually create the work, I have to kind of you know, distill so much down to, okay, what is actually absolutely necessary here? And we pick a path and we take the path. And so a lot of stuff gets left uh, behind. But sometimes there's just like a little like tea to something where I'm like, okay, you know, I want to come back to that later. It doesn't, it doesn't, kind of leave me alone. I, I keep going, okay, there's something there, but not for this piece. And so I usually, um, in from watching the work be performed, I start to get a sense of something, okay, this is what I think the next steps are. So it's not like it's an evolution, but it's there's clues in the previous works and sometimes it's actually, okay, I need to really work in contrast to what I just did because I'm, you know, I, I, I need, I need to feel different in my own body. Um, you know, there's different kind of hungers that come out of, of being so intimately connected to a work over four to six years and then starting a new work. And it's like, okay, I, I, I have to follow this other thread. Yeah. Uh, like right now, we're looking at images from Monumental and, you know, the dancers are isolated on the blocks and Park um, uh, Frontera came after this. And so working with the parkour and having the dancers just move through the space. I mean, that was such a desire after Monumental where everything was like siloed yeah. and super repressed. And I was like, oh, my God, the dancers got to get them moving. I just want them to like eat the whole stage, you know, with their presence and, you know, have velocity. Yeah. So, you know, that's a good example of, of uh, you know, a response to a previous work and then uh, a desire that comes out of it. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a long, it's a long process. Yeah. And it's also because we're not rehearsing full time and all of that, you know, it's periods of time that we work. And all the dancers, you know, work for other choreographers as well. And I'm making other things in between. Yeah. So, yeah, it takes it takes time. What are you um, for the the gig in Abu Dhabi? Is Fly Pan Am going to be there or is it a recording or how does that work? Oh, yeah. No, they're playing live. <laughs> yeah, they're playing live. Yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't be the same without them playing live. It's just the energy of live music, right? It's just you know, so special. Amazing. Wow. That's mm -hmm. super, super special. So they always play live at every every uh, version of this? Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they do. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Can I ask you for like um, some advice? No. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you for advice. Okay. Okay, so um, let's say I was 15 and I, I'm you know, a 15-year-old who attends your show. And I come up to you and I'm like, I'm so moved. Uh, I love, you know, I take, I take dance classes. Um, I take some contemporary and I want to pursue this professionally. What are the do's and don'ts for me to 
keep in mind if I'm interested very seriously in pursuing this uh, profession professionally? Uh, I think, uh, you know, what's incredible about uh, dancers nowadays, just lost my earphone, um, is that they're so versatile in so many different forms, you know, from kind of, uh, you know, hip hop to, you know, crumping to contemporary to ballet, you know, they, they can do so many uh, they have many influences. So I would say to a young dancer, take as many different classes as possible. Um, and especially, you know, they're young, they have energy, just like train, 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 train with whoever you can. Uh, and uh, if you are considering uh, going into this uh, professionally, uh, basically count on having a uh, second profession alongside this too because it's it's not obvious um the trajectory of being a contemporary dancer so i i often recommend you know try and you know i don't know uh get skills so you could teach yoga classes or pilates or you know have have something else so that in between gigs there's a way of of uh, also you know taking care of your body but also just, uh, you know, financially having some kind of uh, substrata to support you. Have you, I mean, like, is this your first time going to the UAE? It is. It is. Yeah, we're, we're so thrilled to be, you know, going to a completely new culture, territory. It's really, yeah, really exciting. Yeah, because it's these types of things have ripple effects like when people see shows like this live um it has total ripple ripple effects right on students who come to see the show and um and people who will get to speak to you afterwards and all this sort of things do you mm -hmm. remember the first couple shows in your early life and career that completely impacted you Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, for me, it was when I first saw La 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 Human Steps uh, perform and uh, it just, it blew my mind. I was like, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. Like I was, I just, I was so like, just completely like altered after that first uh, performance of theirs that I saw. I mean, also Louis Le Cavier, who was, you know, just uh, so incredibly uh, uh, inspiring. I mean, she was just like a dynamo. I mean, she's still dancing, um, you know, now in her sixties. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it just, uh, was completely like, I was so empowered to like, this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. Do you, if I were to ask you for like, um, for recommendations, let's go back to this 15 year old, this hypothetical 15 year old mm -hmm. who's like, oh my God, the show is amazing. Um, I wish there were shows like this in Abu Dhabi all the time. Alas, there aren't. Um, what should I look up online? You know, what dance companies should I try to find uh, performances online of or or uh, films or documentaries? What are the like go-to things that any um, very excited teenager should go check out online? Uh, interesting. Uh, um, hmm. That's a that's a hard question yeah. to uh, answer. Uh, I would say. Um, I mean, this is just this is personal taste. Yeah, personal. I, totally I love personal. the work. Uh, the work that uh, Giselle Vienne is doing. She's actually a theater maker and originally a puppeteer, uh, but she has done some incredible uh, uh, pieces with non-dancers that are incredibly physical. Uh, and uh, so I would, I would say, you know, look at her work. Uh, the work of uh, um, Boris Charmatz, I think, is really interesting. He's now um, running the Pina Bausch Company. He's the artistic director there now. His work was very different than Pino's work. 
Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, if you can see any of Pina's, uh, Pina Bausch's old work, uh, for sure. Uh, um, you know, that was something that uh, also really inspired me when I first uh, started uh, choreographing. I, you know, I really like experimental work and not necessarily work that is like my work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think, um, Maggie Morin of France as well does, uh, some really incredible work. There's Rosas, of course, which is a very established Belgian company. Uh, um, but you know, there's, there's so many great young choreographers out there, uh, now as well, you know, Ona Doherty from Ireland. Uh, uh yeah, there's cool. And many, Amazing. many, many wonderful uh, people making work out there. Yeah, it's a lot, a lot to uh, <laughs> to uh, find, you know. And the thing with the internet now, it's like you can find yeah. so much, so much material on YouTube. And you know, when I mentioned Pina Bausch, I the first show of hers I saw on VHS. I went to the Guta Institute and I got out a VHS of Cafe Muller, and I felt like I had some kind of contraband item in my hand it was so like i'm like what is this this is so amazing and uh you know just it was really hard to to see things outside of your own community yeah uh, you know pre-internet so i'm dating myself now no i i mean i i i had those same experiences um but i appreciate you going off the cuff for that list because <laughs> um, I like that, um, asking these types of questions without much notice so that it's like things off the top of the head. Um, and, yeah. and is more personal. I mean, the stuff that comes straight to you, to your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, when you approach these types of things, you were talking about the little tweaks that you do for Frontera, for example. Um, what inspires those tweaks? Are they just like, based off personnel or based off the stage that you're performing on, um, what would inspire a tweak from one show to another? Uh, definitely the size of uh, stage. Uh, you know, some stages are larger, some are smaller. So, you know, definitely spacing is always something that we're tweaking. But usually it's it's all detail. It's like, it's like I start to kind of see more of the individual performer and I feel like, okay, they could push this aspect of, of a quality that I know that they have. Uh, usually it's a it's syntax, really. It's like, okay, that could, you could hold that longer. Mm. You could, uh, you know, add an accent on the end of that movement, uh, you know, or like intention, you know, what's the intention? What pulls you on stage? What pushes you off stage? And, you know, in Frontera, those would be things that I'm, I'm looking at. Um, you know, who are you in relationship to at every given moment? Um, so these are all tiny, tiny uh, details, but, you know, they say the devil is in the detail. Yeah. So... <laughs> Do you see any sort of, again, for the the uninitiated, the people who don't exist in the sort of performing arts world, are there trends that you think are emerging in the field of dance and choreography today um, that weren't around 10, 15 years ago or earlier parts in your career that you're excited about that you think uh, people should keep an eye on? Trends. Uh, well, I think, again, I think everything has gotten a lot more eclectic mm -hmm. and there's so many more kind of hybrid dance styles. Uh, uh, so performances where, you know, that might include uh, voguing or uh, again, you know, bringing in a language from hip hop and it's merged with contemporary Yeah. So I think, you know, it used to be very like, you know, this was ballet and this was contemporary and it was, uh, these things were very classifiable and, uh, you know, they, they had strong borders around them. And I think everything's much more porous now. Yeah. And I think uh, different styles of dancing and different uh, types of dancers 
and different types of dancers' bodies and um, presentation can exist and coexist together. So I think it's uh, becoming much more fluid in that way, which I think is super interesting. Yeah. Uh, because it's not, um, you know, before there was this feeling like, well, you know, your body would, would fit in ballet, but doesn't fit here or, you know, more likely like, oh, well, you're too tall. You could be in ballet or, you know, you look too strong. You can be in ballet, you know? So there's, there was just, uh, uh, you know, often I know when I started dancing, it's like, well, if you didn't fit into the stereo, you know, mold, then you had to be over in the contemporary dance section, <laughs> you know? So it, it, it just was very, it felt very, um, limiting and that aesthetics really dictated so much. And I think uh, now uh, it's not the case. And I love seeing also, you know, shows where like you have non-dancers with dancers or different kinds of performers coming together. And uh, that to me is like super exciting. And I think it's, uh, you see that, you know, across the board in, in dance. You know, it's interesting, like, the the borders between different styles have been taken down because of the internet and because of um you know media essentially i think um mm -hmm. i wonder if those borders still are um remain when it comes to regional styles so for example like fly pan am as you said is like a very like montreal sound right <laughs> do you feel like your group has an equivalent Montreal feel? Um, no, I wouldn't say so. I, in Montreal, uh, you know, as a community, uh, the dance community is very eclectic, mm. very, very eclectic. And I would say not at all. Um, I don't know what the Montreal thing would be for dance. Uh, yeah. I could have maybe said that in the, the 90s or early zeros, but I couldn't tell you now. Uh, because I think also the, the borders between what is considered performance and what is dance have become blurred as well. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Fly Pan Am, you know, they're also very much, you know, influenced by Kraut Rock. So, yeah. you know, they, they also, uh, you know, uh, kind of traverse uh, musical uh, borders and boundaries, you know, given their vast uh, array of influences and, uh, you know, they, and they do stand out in the Montreal scene. They very much have their own sound. Yep. Amazing. Yeah, it's it's interesting how that um self -re um referential everything is. You know, everything is uh mm -hmm. cross border in that way. Yeah. I'm curious if you have any upcoming projects that people should look out for or sort of look up um what are you working on now? Uh well at the the same day we open on October 12th in the, the Red Theatre uh, in London, England. Uh, UVA is opening uh, their, uh, I think, oh, this is, I'm terrible. I've got jet lag. I'm going to say 20th anniversary show, um, which is a series of installations, new and old, at the 180 uh, Strand. This and we have a new... United Visual Arts. United Visual yeah. Artists. Yeah. yeah. And we have a new uh, uh, installation that we worked on together this summer called oh. Ensemble that's opening uh, at the same time in uh, Roger Tellier Craig from Fly Pan Am did the sound for it. Uh, so that's kind of happening at the same time. Uh, cool. <laughs> yeah. And then I'm starting research on two new uh, projects that will be uh, performances, but very early stages and, uh, continuing to develop a project that I did this summer at, uh, Ypsic Rock in, um, uh, Sicily with Marie Davidson, musician, Marie Davidson. She's, um, electronic musician and a solo, uh, that I made for myself. 
And uh, yeah, continuing to work on that that piece. Jeez. Yeah, no wonder you have jet lag. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, chasing my tail. <laughs> um, if you were to give yourself advice um, 20 years ago, what advice would you have given yourself? 20 years ago, I would say trust yourself. I think, you know, it's... Um, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I think that now I I just trust that I'll get there, that we will get there, the team, uh, where probably 20 years ago I would have been, uh, you know, overcompensating for not trusting the process and be micromanaging or something or not sleeping. Yeah. Uh, where, where now, I, you know, I, I feel... I feel um, I don't know, it, at home in my body as an artist, and I've come to accept that that's actually, my, it's my life. I think I always, I, I don't know, felt like an outsider a bit that, you know, I don't know, that I was going to get over being an artist one day and get a normal job or something. You know, I think that's just probably upbringing and, uh, uh, you know, a kind of societal, you know, outlook. But now I'm just like, no, uh, this is me. I'm I'm a weirdo, and I'll always be a weirdo. And <laughs> I'm an artist <laughs> till uh, you know my last days. I will be an artist because it's just it's about a perspective. It's how you look at the world. It's how you live your life. So yeah. <laughs> Wait, did you do the, did you take the advice that you were giving the 15 year old? Were you like a yoga teacher on the side as well? Uh, well, no, I, I became a, 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 a jar tonic, uh, uh, master trainer as a result of an injury. Okay. So, uh, like going through a rehabilitation process and kind of not being satisfied with, the um, the, the process I, I, got introduced to this method that I, I just fell in love with. And I, I actually just started teaching it because I loved it so much, but wow. then it's really seen me through, you know, periods where it's not been so easy because, you know, we rely on, on funding yeah. and, uh, you know, it, it, we live so unsustainably as artists uh, because there is no safety net, and it's always just kind of like every every time we're starting again. Uh, so, you know, it's nice to have a little bit of um, a foundation under me where I know that I I can uh, you know <laughs> get by. Yeah. I feel yeah. you for sure. Um, let's mm -hmm. do the quick Q&A and then we're going to wrap up. So okay. um, what are you reading or watching these days? Uh, I have just started reading uh, Jenny O'Dell's newest book, which, uh, what is her newest book? Her last book, which I adored, was How to Do Nothing. It's about mm -hmm. attention economy. What is her new book? Saving oh, Time. Thank you. Saving Time. Uh, yes, I love her perspective. So I started uh, reading that uh, recently. Um, uh, watching. Well, on the plane, I watched all of season one of Top Boy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I heard it. Which is a British. I heard it's great. TV series, yeah, um, it, yeah, it's fantastic. I think Brian Eno just he did the the all the sound for the third season. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's it's gritty. You know, it's like if you um, the person sitting in the seat behind me when we were deplaning said, "Oh, so did you enjoy Top Boy? It's so great." And I said, "Yeah." He's like. Well, have you seen The Wire? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, yeah. It's like, so it's it's in the, you know, the kind of uh, vein of the the wire. Yeah. But huh? yeah, I mean, I, I I'm I'm a movie buff. I love I love uh film is really inspiring to me. Yeah. And uh, uh you know, so but yeah, cool. on a plane, I'm kind of like, okay, it's 
like TV is good for a plane because then you get like hooked into (laughs) an episode and then you're you've arrived. Have you seen um, uh, on my last very long flight actually to Abu Dhabi? um, I watched uh, We Run This Town. Have you seen that? No, it's by um, it's by Edward. uh, um, uh, David Simon and Edward Burns, the guys who did The Wire. Okay. Um, okay. And it's uh, it's based on a true story. It takes place in sort of 2020, 2020, 2020, or like the 2012, whatever, this century, uh, in Baltimore, mm-hmm. it, uh, embedded in the police department, and is kind of... Oh, yeah. Actually, I have seen that. Yes. Oh, my God. It's yes. so good, right? Yeah, so good. So good. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, there's all yeah. these like uh wire um <laughs> um actors that are in it and you're like, "Oh my god." Yeah, 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 yeah. You've yeah, gained yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, weight, yeah, no, but you look great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Um yeah. Okay, let's keep on going. So, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? There's a visual artist, uh, Francis Salis, who I am really fascinated with his uh, work. And uh, I think I, I it would be interesting to shadow him for a day. He's, uh, he's an artist. He pushed a giant cube of ice, uh, like of ice through Mexico City. He's based, I think, or was based in Mexico City. And it's this documentation of him just pushing this giant block of <laughs> ice until it's completely melted how funny um yeah so i think he would be uh, someone interesting to shadow yeah. I'd be curious yeah what do people most misunderstand about your work i think uh the fact that it, it's meant to be raw in in a sense meaning that i don't want it to be overly polished mm-hmm so I want, I want, it's like, you know, if there's moments of unison, I want it to be same, but different. That's, I always use that. So I'm not interested in kind of things being too, too clean and too perfect. Yeah. They, they aren't like identical replicas of each other. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is that an evolution or that's how you've always been as a, as an artist? Uh, I would say that's been an evolution. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It, yeah. And it's it's because it's also just really uh, loving those differences between the performers and and wanting those to to read. So no one feels like they have to be like anyone else. Amazing. Um, yeah. So if people want to find out about the show, it is happening... Uh, on the NYU AD Art Center website, you can find out about it. Um, it is, what's the date of the show? I want to get this right. 12th and 13th. Okay, great. Next so week. <laughs> October 12th and 13th. This episode is going to be coming out before then. So um, go get your tickets if they're still available. Um, Dana, thanks so much for doing this. So much fun. Oh, such a pleasure. Such a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much. And look forward to being in Abu Dhabi. Yay. Yeah. Bring a bathing suit. Okay. Definitely. (laughs) We were wondering what to pack. (laughs) A bathing suit is a good idea. (laughs) Great. 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 Thanks so much. Thank you so much. (laughs) 